So I know you've been waiting with bated breath, lots of gnashing of teeth and uh, uh, other things like that for part two of the top five reasons Bonanzas and Barons crash. So stick with me on Flywire. Hey, I'm Scott Perdue and today on Flywire, part two of the series of top five reasons Bonanzas and Barons crash. Hey, I'm sorry if uh, you watch part one and you go, well, I don't know what the top five are. Well, the, the bottom line is that YouTube doesn't like long videos. And if I put both of those together, it would be a long video and they probably wouldn't put it in their algorithm and you wouldn't see it anyway. So what the heck? I had to show you the statistics of where it came from. So I didn't just pull it out of my butt. I actually did some research to find out what the top five reasons are. So, well, before I actually do that, <laughs> stick with me more and more second. I got a couple of corrections from the previous video. Uh, turns out there's 4,808 36 series airplanes built, and uh, that makes the crash rate of 14% instead of 17%. So it's a little bit safer. Still the most crash rate of uh, the Bonanza series. Uh, also, uh, I misspoke a little bit when I talked about the uh, fatality accidents um, as a percentage. I said a percentage of built, and what I meant to say, and I did say when I talked about the Barons, was it's a percentage of the accidents. So it's around just over 30% the fatality rate. The fatality accidents are just over 30% of the fatality of the accidents as a whole, not of the numbers built. Um, anyway. Let's see, uh, I also meant to type 1969 as the start year for the B-58s, the 58 series. Somehow I put 59 in there, I don't know why. Maybe it's dyslexia. Um, the 58s were just a development of the long body uh, 36, like the 55 series was a development of the short body. Uh, also, um, I think I, I said that I did, I, I had 56 series airplanes in there and I didn't, they weren't involved. No 56 series of travel airs. So that's my, my alibis for the previous video. So here we go, the top five. Let's go to the top five. Since we have all these, these lies slash statistics teed up, we can begin to make conclusions. More importantly, we can now look at the top five accidents for the period. Uh, I haven't bounced this off the null report. Uh, this is my work alone. I pulled the database. I ran the numbers and, you know, my dog ate my homework. I do, however, stand by my own stats, which uh, translates to you best remember what Mark Twain said. <laughs> anyway. So what are the top five? Let's start with the 35 series. The first one is fuel, then landing. Okay, that's the number two one. The number three one is uh, loss of control in flight. Number four is takeoff. And then number five is mechanical. That's the rack and stack there. For the 33 series, uh, the, the uh, top accident types, top five are landing, number one, number two, fuel, uh, number three, loss of control in flight. Mm, that's interesting. Four, takeoff. And then five, VFR and IMC. That's different. And you're going to see a little more of that in here in a second. For the A36 series, it goes loss of control in flight. That's huge. Then fuel. Number three is landing. Number four is takeoff. And then uh, number five is mechanical. Yeah, that's pretty common there. Okay, so there are some commonalities there. So let's look at the top five for Barons. So I combined them. So it is what it is. Number one was landing. And the number two is loss of control in flight, and I think that's significant. Number three is fuel. Number four is takeoff. And number five, again, is mechanical. So they all have that in, in uh, common, takeoff mechanical there uh, in the top five, but at the back end of it, okay? So let's look at the hit list combined. The first thing that jumps out at me is that most of the top three is for most of the top three. The order is different, but they're all pretty much the same. I'm going to talk a little more in depth than that in a second. But the second thing that uh, strikes me here is that takeoff phase number four is ranked for all the models, all the same. Loss of directional control on the ground was by far and away the biggest tally with failure to climb making its mark. Okay, 
boom. Okay, we lost direction control on the takeoff run, but then we also lost it right after takeoff. The surprising thing that was for 35, 36s and barons, mechanical rate ranked fifth. These accidents seems to seem to cluster around the first flight after major maintenance, and landing gear was a major issue. Landing gear failure of one reason or another. Engine, fa engine related problems were also played a big role, but the database didn't have enough dif detail to differentiate whether the recency of overhaul, top overhaul, or other major maintenance was a factor. It just didn't do it. Maybe the docket for each one, but that's a lot of actions to go through. For some reason, more than 33 pilot, more, more 33 pilots than any other type were trying to climb into weather without crucial planning items completed. You know, things like having an instrument rating. Kind of surprising, but that's it. So, what do we do? Uh, now that we've been through all these statistics and produced the top five reasons why Bonanzas and, and Barons crash, and the surprises, they virtually, they're almost virtually the same. Uh, the number's actually a little bit different for each model. But it turns out there is nothing radically different about operating a particular type, and that's interesting. Given this information, what do we do with it? We're talking about real live people that aren't here anymore, so how do we figure this out? How do we concentrate on these n numbers to bring it down? Let's look at number five. Uh, I probably shouldn't have flipped that slide, so. Anyway, let's look at five number of mechanical reasons. Most of these can be attributed to mistakes made after maintenance. So spend a few extra minutes going over the airplane with a fine tooth comb and make a test flight if it involved anything engine related or gear related. Be careful about that. An extra measure of care would go a long way to impact these accidents, I think. Other than that, I'm not sure I can preach on it. For number four, takeoff accidents, well, I think you gotta be disciplined. Compute your distances, check your acceleration every time. Make the abort decision on the ground before you start an engine. That way, when your threshold, your abort threshold is met, you just execute. Don't think about it. Don't weigh the pros and cons, just do it. And pretty much you gotta do that on the ground. As a matter of course, I recommend that you think about this situation, the, any one of these situations really in the air that, that might occur, you develop parameters and use, this, use the decision making on the ground. What are those parameters? And, and figure it out before you fly. As humans, we react better in stressful situations if we have clearly defined set of actions to execute with the indicators along, along with those. The old if-then decision tree. Humans just don't have a good track record of making it up as we go along. It's just the truth. So let's look at the game of the glider. Now we're in the top five. Running out of gas for one reason or another is all over this database. The, uh, this is pretty much purely on the pilot. I don't see other way to do that. The funny thing is in the early 35s, you know, they had a very complicated fuel system. Tanks were small, but the largest number of fuel accidents seemed to happen in airplanes with the bigger tanks, the 40 gallon or better for the Barons. Have a standard plan that you work out on the ground and then you test in the air and use that plan, that method every time you fly, every time. Of course, refueling on the ground before takeoff might also be a good idea. You wouldn't believe it how many times that ran into problems. And I think it also might be a good idea to put a good fuel totalizer in there and maybe the CIS fuel centers plumbed into a good engine monitor to have really good data. Uh, just me, but there it is. Again, fuel is a discipline matter. We all know we need fuel, so just don't push it. And be careful trying to use a 40-gallon tank with less than six gallons to shoot a decent landing. Fuel on porting is a thing. Don't be another statistics. statistic. Way too many fatal accidents were the result of running out of, get, out of gas. That's just the, that is in the database. So, landing phase. For the uh, gear up landing was a large factor for all beach aircraft. Okay, distraction being the most common excuse. Next up for 33, 35s and 33s, landing errors seem to be more loss of control on the ground, but for 36 and barons, the loss of control happens more on the approach with resulting stall spin, okay? Which, okay, why is that happening? Well, what is disturbing to me is the large number of control flight into terrain when continuing an approach to below mins. That's not the stall spin, that's I go below my minimums on the approach. This has happened out of proportion to 36s and 30, 30, A36s and Barons as compared to the, the 35s and 33s. Those trees and rocks come up real fast when you're low in, in the soup. And I think you gotta ask yourself, 
What does minimum mean to you? Here's the scenario. I don't see the runway environment uh, or the lights. I'm not in a position to land without heroics, so what do I do? It's a good question. My nickel on the grass is I need to make this decision again on the ground. Do I go missed when I hit those things or do I just continue? After all, I've wired the approach, I've done it a hundred times, and I just have to land right here, like right now. So no, it's no sweat, no big deal. The question really is, do you really need to land? Do you really have to do that? Is it worth your life? That's the balance. I'm not kidding here. This type of accident stuns me. A cavalier decision made in a split second and everyone pays the ultimate price. So at that point, inconvenience really doesn't seem so bad when stacked against terrain or terrain impact, I should say. Okay. So now I have a story I'm going to tell on myself. This is an F4 story. Uh, that's why the picture. Okay. I had a minor emergency rel relatively low on fuel. Uh, the weather was at minimums. The nearest divert was 160 miles away. And if I had to divert, my problems would be far greater than right now, than they were right now. So I'd say there was some pressure on me. And I was going to shoot a PAR, that's a precision approach radar, where the controller gives you vectors. A good radar controller, good PAR guy, can do better than ILS. It, it's really good. PARs were more common in Europe than ILSs were. We had them a lot. I don't think there's many PARs left now. There are uh, ASRs, but not PARs. This day, there was a crosswind from the left, and I had the approach wired. I was on it. The controller was on it. And oh, by the way, the approach speed was just shy of 160 knots. We were cooking. When the controller announced minimums, I looked outside for the approach lights. That's what I was used to seeing, and that's what I wanted to see. But I didn't see them. I could see the runway edge lights, but for some reason, I desperately wanted to see those approach lights. So I spent some time doing that. At that point, I had given up on my crosswind correction. I started to drift to the right side of the runway, and the controller started yelling at me to go around. And that bothered me so much that, you know, I just keyed the mic. I got to concentrate here and fly the plane. I could see the runway, so I just eased over to the left, and I landed. Okay, uh, realized that the runway was over 12,000 feet long. So it was no big deal, really. But I'd, uh, I'd say that that situation is pretty rare. This particular thing was pretty rare. Should I have gone around? Well, maybe that would be a good point of discussion after, uh, after the talk. You can leave me a comment or uh, we, can, we can talk about it after. Oh, the reason I couldn't see the approach lights at 200 AGL was uh, they were right under the nose. The deck angle on the F4 approach is a bit over 10 degrees nose up. So 200 feet, you don't see there. So loss of control in flight. That's the next one. Uh, for A36 accidents, uh, this was number one and accounted for 18% of all accidents. Okay, that's 2% larger than number two, which was fuel, and then 6% larger than the landing accidents. For Barron's, the loss of control in flight was two, number two at 14% of all accidents, and that's twice the number of number three, the fuel accidents. That's a big deal. This is not a small problem. All airplane types are experiencing loss of control of flight. What did strike me reading the Barron reports, though, were the sheer number of loss and loss of control in flights that result resulted in spins. Spinning a Barron is not a good thing. Spin recovery in a twin is counterintuitive. No manufacturer does twi spin testing in a twin. They're not required to. Uh, they might have done it, but they're not required to. There are no published techniques. And the problem is that those engines here and the fuel tanks here uh, create a polar moment of inertia that add significant autorotational moments. And that's what we're going to talk a little bit about right here to understand what's going on. So uh, before I get to that, yeah, here we go. So here's a perfect example of the conservation of angular momentum and how changing the polar moment of inertia changes the spin rate. The energy state says this stays the same, but the spin rate changes. And you already know this. You know, if you haven't connected the dots, you've seen ice skaters do this all the time. So let's see what happens when we, kind of, when we push this to an airplane. Okay, these are, this is spin coupling, polar moments of inertia. Uh, in this F-104, here's the engine, there's the cockpit, and the fuel in the wings. All these are significant mass locations, and the, you can see that the moment arm of each mass location is different 
And that difference shows up as oscillations about the spin axis because it's not level like this, it's down like this. So you've got a lot of weird uh, moments going on there. So uh, I want to show you a little video right quick. In spin aileron, okay, that's what's going on here. When you get this whole system spinning, very weird things happen, and your rudder may not be large enough to overcome the autorotational moments of the spinning system. So there is a technique that might work, but you won't see me making a video about it, even though I slept in a holiday inn the other day. I'm not going to risk a lawsuit over an experimental concept. If you spin a Baron, you're a test pilot. Good luck. That being said, we had, uh, we had uh, a spin procedure in the F-15E, uh, uh, so, and it, it seemed to work pretty good. So here's my pitch. I want you to step outside the box as part of your ongoing training program, really. How do we stop loss of control in flight? We've got a, fig got a point on that. It's killing a lot of folks every year, and I would be willing to bet that most of you out there, you're thinking, well, you know, that doesn't really apply to me. I know how to fly, and I always stay well within the boundaries. And I'm going to reply that that mindset was also held by the vast majority of folks that ended up in my loss of control in flight database. There isn't a vaccine for this. There isn't a magic speed you can fly that's going to keep you safe no matter what. I can guarantee that if you've never departed an airplane before, you will not think your way out of it. And as the saying goes, shit happens. Get me in trouble with YouTube, but there it is. And you just never know when it might happen to you. In my opinion, the only way to fix this is to train for it. You have to prepare. That's the bottom line. So let's take a look at the spin slide. You ready? Am I doing it? No, I'm not. Well, you're doing the recovery. Okay. All right. There we go. Here's the spin. Idle neutral path. Idle. Ground to the right. Chomp. There you go. Right. Go. It's a lot of ground. Never seen that before. Take the river out, take the river out. There you go. Keep on up to the road. First time you ever try it, that's a lot of ground to look at. So I've taught a lot of pilots in this UPRT, Upset Prevention Recovery Technique uh, Training arena and the first time you see a lot of ground in the windshield like we just saw right here as you're pointing straight down your your reaction and almost invariably it is a holy blank and if it happens outside of a training environment the odds of your survival are not ever in your favor so my nickel is is that you go get training you explore the edge you learn what falling out the edge is like so then you can react instantly to prevent a full-blown departure in a spin Time is not on your side in this case. Do you see the spin there was maybe, it was less than five seconds. Speaking of time, both the 737 MAX accidents were uh, severe upsets that were survivable. The Sirijawa 737 accident was survivable. The 767 primary crash in Houston was a self-induced upset that was survivable. That particular crash took 18 seconds from cruising at 6,000 feet to nose down nose first into a lake, 18 seconds. Think about that. Think about whether the first time you see a stressful situation like that, can you focus on what the most important thing to do first is in 18 seconds, if you've never seen it before. So what I'd like to leave you with today is the notion that everything you do when you walk up to an airplane with the intention of committing aviation should be, to be, it should be intentional. In other words, you fly the plane, you don't let the, fly, the airplane fly you, you do things on purpose, with a purpose. Uh, you just don't make it up as you go along. We take our lives and the lives of our passengers into our hands each time we fly, and maybe that's a good idea to spend a little time managing the risk before we start engines. Good decisions don't happen by accident, and it's rare a good decision it can be made quickly uh, from first look. At least that's, that's my take on this whole thing. Okay, that's my take on the top five reasons Bonanzas and Barons crash. And I think what I'm gonna do is, I'm actually gonna do, I am gonna do a part three 
it's going to have to do some more research for Cessnas and Pipers and CRI. We're going to talk about those two, so it'll be a later video in this particular series, Top 5. Uh, but what I want to do is, because uh, I've gotten a lot of questions and a lot of comment, comments on this, is I'm going to flush out the, what the top five are, actually, from the probable cause thing. So what we're going to do is I'm, I'm going to run through the top five reasons. I uh, may, may do it in a couple of videos. It depends on how long it is. But we're going to actually list what the pro, uh, a smattering, a selection of the, the actual probable cause comments are. And we're going to see just how, how, they, uh, how they reflect the uh, accident itself. I find it interesting. You might as well. So look forward to that. Thanks for watching this video. Uh, I appreciate it. And, well, we'll see you next time on Flywire.